So th there is something poignant about um, hearing these scriptures today on this particular Sunday. And Rob was right, as I understand he often is, that um, they would have been better in the other, <laughs> other order. But anyway. Um, so this past Thursday was Ascension Day, when Jesus ascended to his heavenly Father when he left the earth for good. The prayer that we just heard Rob read was Jesus praying to God about the disciples. In that prayer, he discloses his concern for them when he is no longer with them. This isn't Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane praying with dread. This is Jesus, the tender shepherd, the loving teacher, the mother hen, imagining leaving his charges, those who have been with him almost 24 hours a day for three years, leaving them and finding it hard. Like parents leaving their firstborn at college, driving away and praying, please, heavenly God, protect him, protect her, protect them, Jesus prays. We are reading this, or hearing this, right after Jesus' departure, before the promise he makes of the Holy Spirit is fulfilled, which it will be next Sunday on Pentecost. So then, as if this were a movie, the scene shifts from the fervently praying Jesus to the gathered disciples, trying to figure out how to go forward. The first thing they do is to try to find a replacement for Judas Iscariot, so there'll be 12 of them once more. They, I'm sure, are reeling from Jesus' departure but I also wonder what it must have been like for them to have had a traitor in their midst. Their grief was surely tinged with shock. But Judas Iscariot is not the disciples' focus now. They want to move forward, and they identify two men who have been with them all along, and they ask God to help them choose they pray and want to know what God's will is. Show us which one to pick. And then they cast lots, and Matthias is selected. I think because the other guy had three names, and if I were voting, it would have been Matthias, because it's so much uh, less confusing. Well, just back up and erase that comment. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> They cast lots. Is it God's direction they want? Or are they casting lots? Are they voting? Is voting how we know God's will? How do we know God's will? How do we distinguish our voice from God's? Which of the events that fill a life are God's handiwork and which are ours? Which of the disappointments and tragedies that befalls us are God's doing? And which are the confluence of time and place and biology and lifestyle? Sometimes I find myself attributing God's will to the problems in my life, whether they are small or large. A flat tire, and I'm thinking, oh, I knew I should have given that homeless man some money. Uh, to larger things like falling down and breaking my arm at a high school play. Oh, I knew I shouldn't have had those judgmental thoughts. <laughs> These connections between misfortune and God's punishing wand fly out of my mind before I even have a chance to think. They are the remnants of a childhood religion. They are the conflation of God's displeasure with my mother's. Happy Mother's Day. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> it is notable that we don't tend to assign God's will to the good fortunes of our life, 
not that we don't sometimes, holding a newborn baby in our arms, we feel God's goodness and wonder. But we're more apt to query God's will when our longing for a child has gone unfulfilled. When life hands us mountains, we try to locate the molehill that caused God to afflict us. But how is it that we know God's will? Perhaps discerning God's will through a rearview mirror is fruitless. Perhaps knowing God's will is most important when we are moving forward, when we are making choices, when we are at a crossroads. But more often, our choices in life, we make daily, all the time, without realizing we are doing it. What we decide to fill our minds with in the many hours we spend in our car. Do we seek out inflammatory rhetoric or soothing music? Do we ride in silence, perhaps inviting God into our heart? Do we ride in a silent car with a noisy and anxious mind? Every step of every day involves choice. And knowing God's will is often unclear to us. We, as a church, have spent a lot of time discerning God's will, trying to know what direction to go. How should we use our resources, our blessed people, our time, our money, our building? Just at last week's annual meeting, there was a slide that showed the process of discernment we've gotten to, what we've gone through to get to this process. And I'm not, I mean, to this place. I'm not totally sure we're confident about God's will even now. But I think we can increase the chances that our actions align with God's will when we attend to what Jesus asks for us in his prayer. Jesus prays for us to all be one, as you and I are one, as Jesus and God are one. We know that, and this church, we know that this church, this denomination, the United Church of Christ, is founded on that desire, that desire that Jesus prays for us. Those words that all may be one are under our denominational cross logo. So it is part of our desire to be and do what Christ has asked us. The early church probably felt like they were doing that. I mean, they were, they were Jews and pagans and Gentiles, they were, and they were all part of the early church. And as the tribalism of the first century broke apart, they created their idea of oneness in Christ. And that was the beginning. But over the centuries, we've had to learn what being one means. Who is included? Over the centuries, we've had to have our eyes opened to who our sisters and brothers in Christ are. Even when Jesus shows us, we still have our eyes closed. We've had to learn that women are part of the wholeness of Christ. Even though Jesus showed us and having his two best friends, Mary and Martha. We've had to learn that children are part of the oneness of Christ, even though Jesus again and again and again put them front and center. We've had to learn that people who come in a different package are part of the oneness. We've had to learn that we come in a different package. We've had to learn that slaves were people. We've had to leave behind some conceptions that we actually thought were cast in stone. I still remember the astonishment of the people of the church I served in Vermont when they found themselves talking about homosexuals out loud in church and not condemning them. 
what we thought we knew as God's will turned out to be our construct. We've had to learn that we are not one without those who bring us to think, those who are differently abled, those whose needs bring us to think through spaces and communications to make God's house accessible for all. We've had to learn that those struggling with pain, physical, chronic, pain, emotional, spiritual, are part of the oneness of Christ. We've had to learn that not everyone is born in the right body. We've had to learn that gender is not the most essential thing about us. Being a child of God is. We're learning now how to think about each other apart from the concept of a single gender. We've had to learn that God's oneness has no admittance fee, no aptitude test, that we have much to learn from those who are not like us. That oneness of, in Christ is not something we do bountifully, not a gift we give, but it is the truth of the church. We need to look at life through many lenses, ones with cracks and shadows, ours that may have a myriad of blind spots. This desire that all may be one is not a 21st century political correctness. It is Christ's first century prayer for us. His knowledge of what we need and what wholeness looks like. <clears throat> I know that we are sitting here in a very homogeneous town, a very homogeneous part of the country that a lot of us assume that there's similarities among us, and there are, and we wonder, well, yeah, that's fine, but where do we find these people? How do we bring them in? And that is not what Jesus is calling us to do. Surely we, we should and we could and we would bring people in, but we do not have to have them sitting in the same room with us to know that we need to know difference, that we need to think, that we need to think with the wholeness and the oneness that Christ calls us to do, that we are the church and the church may be one. And recently, I'm beginning to believe that here, that we, that the church is the salvation of our time. We need to follow Jesus' direction. We need to learn humanity everywhere and anytime we can. Jesus prayed for us, prayed for God to protect us. I pray for God to protect us from ourselves and open us to the world. Amen.